Yeah. All right. Uh, one second. Good. Um, so as I almost alluded to already, what I'm going to talk about today is um, functional sequential treatment allocation. So treatment allocation uh, where the individuals to be treated, one, arrive sequentially, and two, you're interested in a, another distributional characteristic than the mean, okay? So this is joint work with uh, David Preinerstorfer uh, in Brussels and with Sergen Veliev in Aarhus. Um, okay, so um, you see, uh, estimation of uh, treatment effects is of course a classic and very important topic. So for example, one may ask, what is the effect of assigning a person to a drug training program on uh, his job prospects? Or what is the effect of a certain drug designed to lower blood pressure uh, on the blood pressure? Or what is the effect of handing out mosquito nets in developing countries on the prevalence of malaria? Now, as I alluded to here, most focus in the literature uh, on treatment allocation has been given to uh, estimating uh, the treatment effects. Less focus has been devoted to the question of how one should assign the treatments in order to achieve a certain uh, objective, okay? Nevertheless, uh, in recent years, there has been increasing focus uh, on the last of these two questions. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, so-called um, statistical treatment rules. So this line of research takes the view of the policy maker. Instead of focusing on how the data should be used uh, in order to uh, conduct a hypothesis test of whether one treatment has an effect over the control or not, one directly takes the view of the policy maker who may not have as his objective simply to uh, max, uh, minimize the sum of type two and type one errors, which would be a triple objective when conducting hypothesis test. Instead, the focus is directly on assigning treatments in a regret minimizing way. And what exactly I mean by regret, I shall become uh, precisely about in about 10 minutes or so, depending on uh, how things go. But basically what our main point is really that the policymaker may be interested in other things than type one and type two errors. He wants to assign as many individuals as possible, as well as possible. So that is going to be our objective function in uh, this talk here. Okay, now I don't want to talk too much about the classical literature here on statistical treatment rule, but now suffice is to say that maybe one of the founders, or perhaps the founder of it, is uh, Mansky, who has a series of paper in the area. And uh, today I'm not going to talk about how to unveil uh, causal effects, but if you're interested in causal effects, as Mithmit just said, I referred to the talk yesterday that we saw by Stefan Berger. Rather, the objective today is to assign treatments in a regret minimizing way. Okay. Now, the literature on statistical treatment rules um, has mainly focused on what I call static treatment problems. That is, problems of a type where you have a data set given already at the outset. This could either be an observational data uh, set or it could be data resulting from a randomized controlled trial. But in both cases, you take the data set as given, and then based on that data set, you want to conduct inference. Say you want to test uh, whether the treatment uh, is better than the control, okay? Now, oftentimes, however, it is the case that the subject to be treated arrive sequentially. So uh, that is what I already tried to explain even before my talk. So for example, people become unemployed throughout the year. And as people become unemployed, you may as a policymaker want to assign them to unemployment programs. So you, you have to have a policy that works online, so to speak. Or similarly, individuals fall ill throughout the year. You can't just wait until the end of the year to treat people. You have to treat them as they become ill. And as you treat people, you observe the outcomes of the treatments. And these outcomes you can then use to assign people who arrive subsequently better, hopefully. So I want to take serious in this talk, first of all, that individuals to be treated often arrive sequentially. So the data set that we base uh, our methods on is not given from the outset, rather you construct it yourself as a policymaker, because you choose uh, 
uh, how you want to assign treatments and based on your assignments, you observe uh, outcomes for given treatments, okay? Good, I think there's already a question. Let me see if I can figure out looking at it. Uh, nope, that was uh, something else. Good, that was a, I just saw something in the chat. Well, so the first thing, let me just repeat then, uh, is that uh, you want to take series that individuals arrive sequentially and that you construct the data set yourself by the way uh, you assign individuals. And secondly, the policy maker may target a different characteristic of the outcome distribution than the mean, okay? Uh, for example, if you're a doctor, you may not only care about how much do I expect this uh, treatment to lower the blood pressure by, I also want to make sure there's not a too high variance. So even though medicament A may have a higher expected treatment effect, it may also be super risky. So you may not want to kill people necessarily. So that already uh, sort of indicates that maybe you're also interested in some sort of dispersion measure, say the variance or interquartile ranges. Um, okay, so as I write in italics here, the two goals of this talk are to take serious one, individuals arriving sequentially, and two, that the policymaker may be interested in other characteristics um, than the mean. So we develop a general framework here in this paper, which allows for, for example, targeting inequality, welfare, or poverty measures, which could also be goals of uh, policymakers to say assign treatments in such a way that uh, inequality is minimized or that welfare is ma maximized, say, through your favorite welfare measures such as uh, Gini welfare. I'll become more precise about which exact functionals of the outcome distribution or framework covers. Okay, good. Now, the framework within the work is that uh, of banded problems, hence the book I showed to you five to 10 minutes ago. And at the core of banded problems lies a trade-off between exploration and exploitation. So on the one hand, you want to explore the merits of the treatments you have available to learn about them so you can assign subsequent individuals as well as possible. But on the other hand, you don't want to waste too much of the sampling effort on exploring because you quickly want to assign the most promising treatment as often as possible. And the first paper, which provided regret guarantees in the setting where one focuses on the mean only is by Herb Robbins and it's from 1952. And, uh, a small story is that uh, during World War II, this problem of uh, designing policies, which good, uh, good uh, statistical properties, was considered intractable by allied scientists. So uh, Peter Whittle says it was uh, suggested to drop this problem over Germany during the war so their scientists could waste their time on it as well. I don't know exactly if the story is true or not. At first, I found it on Wikipedia, which of course one should be cautious about. But then I chased through to the references at Wikipedia. And indeed, the anecdote is actually mentioned in a discussion of a paper by Gittins in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. Well, that makes it more true or not, uh, let uh, you guys judge. Um, okay, good. Now, I don't want to talk too much about the whole literature on banded problems, but instead I want to draw your attention to the blue bullet point here. Namely, if you're still interested in the topic after this talk here, I can re recommend the monograph by uh, Sebastian Bubek and Nicolo Cesar Bianchi. It's freely available online on archive uh, from 2012, or alternatively, um, the book that I just showed uh, 10 minutes ago by Tor Latimore and Chava Shepesvari. And the book is also available on Tor Latimore's website for free. So you can have a look at it there. Uh, before you commit to uh, buying it. So, uh, but in common for these sources is that they all focus on the case where you as a policymaker or a decision maker uh, are interested in uh, assigning the treatment with the highest mean as often as possible. And they don't devote much attention slash no attention to the case where you're interested in uh, general functionals of the outcome distribution. Okay. So, so that being said, we must develop a separate theory that hopefully covers as many functionals as possible, but also still allows us to prove uh, upper bound on the worst case performance uh, of the algorithms. So uh, that is a target we're going to uh, embark on uh, next. Okay, 
So now I'll introduce a more formal framework after uh, this introduction of the topic here. Good. The subjects to be treated arrive sequentially. And in total, we as policymakers are going to make N assignments. The total number of assignments, N, that I'm going to make may or may not be known to the policymaker. So sometimes you may know that this treatment program will be applied to, say, 5,000 individuals. In that case, you know N. Other times, it may be the case that uh, this unemployment program will be run for the next two years. And you do not generally know how many individuals will become unemployed in the course of those two years. However, it's intuitively clear that knowing the total number of assignments you have to make could be useful. Because imagine the following situation. If you know in advance that you have to make only 100 assignments in total, then you're probably going to experiment shorter than if you know in advance you're going to make 1 million assignments. So if you're going to make 1 million assignments, you may set aside, say, 10,000 observations to experiment um, and find out which of the available treatments works best before you commit to a treatment. Well, clearly, you wouldn't set aside 10,000 observations for experimentation if you only have to make 100 um, uh, assignments in total. So it makes sense that it could be useful to know um, the total number of assignments that you have to make. Hence, we're going to study policies that do and do not uh, require knowledge of the horizon, i.e. total number of assignments that have to be made. The number of available treatments we call K. K can be strictly greater than two, so it doesn't have to be the case that only two treatments are available. And each subject here, a bit unconventionally, subjects uh, indexed by T rather than I, but that's because of the fact that the, that the individuals arrive sequentially. So you can also think of subject T arriving at time T. So subject T has a vector of potential outcome. It's K-dimensional and takes uh, values in the K-fold product of uh, the closed interval from A to B. Now, if we want to prove anything, uh, we have to first make clear what we even understand by a policy, or some may call it by an assignment algorithm. And a policy in our terminology here is a triangular array of functions. So it, it's indexed by n and t, hence a triangular array, which for a given total number of assignment n indicates what assignment I want to make to the teeth person arriving. Okay? Now, the assignment I make to individual T can depend on previously observed treatment outcomes. That is, it can be depend on the T minus one previously observed treatment outcomes, which we call take values in uh, the K for the product of the closed interval from A to B. And it can also uh, depend on randomization, the T minus one past randomization and one current randomization. Okay? So, each of uh, these functions in this triangular array of functions here can depend on past observed treatment outcomes and past and current randomizations, okay? And it's a mapping into the set of uh, potential treatments. So for, at each, for each individual, the function has to tell me which treatment do I want to assign. So it assigns one of the elements in the set of uh, available treatments here, okay? Good. Now, we assume here that uh, the individual who arrived to be treated uh, uh, IID. However, we do not put any restrictions between the correlation of the potential of the K potential outcomes. Okay, so two treatments with similar ingredients, if we're talking about drugs, could of course have highly correlated treatment outcomes. One piece of important of notation is the following: we denote by FI um, the distribution pertaining uh, to the ith treatment, okay? So it's a CF of YIT. We know that this does not depend on T due to the IID assumption up here, okay? And, oh, sorry, by, we denote by um, Z, uh, T minus one, the history of uh, past observed treatment outcomes and randomization, okay? And GT denotes a uh, random variable that we can use for randomizing treatment assignments. This is, of course, crucial for this framework to encompass uh, randomized controlled trials where the treatment assignments depends purely on a coin flip in case there are um, uh, two potential assignments only. So it's important if we want to encompass classical policies such as randomized controlled trials that will allow for such randomization, GT here. 
Okay, good. Now, how do we measure the quality of a treatment? Well, traditionally, most focus has been given to the case where one targets the mean outcome, as I already alluded to. However, the policymaker may not only be interested in the mean outcome of the treatment, he could be interested also in the treatment which has the highest 95th quantile or the treatment if one is a finance guy which has the lowest value at risk or you could be interested in higher moments than the mean or you could be interested in inequality welfare or poverty measures instead so uh, maybe some a benevolent policymaker doesn't only care about the sum of the treatment outcome as measured through the means but also about the, uh, the poverty implications of a sequence of assignments that he makes. So our theory encompasses a large uh, array of uh, inequality, wealth, and poverty measures. And the next two bullet points here mention just some of them. Of course, if you're a finance guy, you may also be interested in sequentially optimizing uh, the Sharpe ratio. Um, so gradually, you sample from different assets you get to know more and more about which asset has the highest sharp ratio and of course you want to invest in as many periods as possible in the asset with the highest sharp ratio uh, more generally you know, for the technically inclined audience our theory al allows for uh, targeting u and l functionals which are simply population variants of uh, u and l statistics and importantly we allow a combination of several functionals. So one functional could of course be the plain mean. That is a special case of our setting. Another functional is the variance. And then one can of course combine the mean and the variance say into the Sharpe ratio or uh, other uh, ways of, uh, of incorporating a mean variance trade-off. Okay, basically what I want to say here is the framework incorporates many other functions of interest beyond the mean, which has been the focus so far in the literature. Good. So what we're studying is the following, a characteristic of interest, which is a functional T of uh, the underlying, on the underlying space of uh, CDFs. So, sorry, T encodes a particular characteristic of uh, the outcome distributions that the policymaker is interested in, say the Gini welfare measure. Good. Now, how do we measure success? or uh, how uh, do we decide whether treatment is good or not? Well, we do the following. Jeez, the mouse is, keeps shifting pages. Anyway, now look at the following equation here. This is what we call the regret. First of all, we ask ourselves, had I known which of the K treatments is the best one and always assigned the one which has the highest uh, value of the functional, what could I then have obtained? Well, then for each of the N assignments I make, I have obtained the value of the functional pertaining to the maximizer over the K treatments. However, I do not know uh, which of the outcome distributions is the best one in the sense that it maximizes the functional. So I instead in period T get uh, the value of a functional which pertains to assigning um, uh, treatment pi and T. Recall pi and T is the assignment I make in a period t or to individual t and then i measure the difference between the best treatment and the treatment assignment i make and i sum it up over all assignments the n assignments in total that i make okay that is what we call the regret of the policy pi and the name of the game is now uh, to prove upper bounds on the worst case performance of the policies in the following sense, namely equation two. So we look at the expected value of the regret and maximize this over a set of potential outcome distributions D here. So I want to find out for given policy pi, if some very vi vicious adversary chooses the distributions, the outcome distributions in a very difficult way, how bad can it go for my policy? And good policies, in this talk here are policies which have a good worst case performance, i.e. policies that are minimax optimal. Okay, so we seek policies that um, are best in the worst case. So we want the best worst case performance over a non-parametric class of distributions D. Now, um, let me stress that the goal of this talk here is not to unveil a causal effect, it is nothing else than uh, um, minimizing the expression 
in uh, two here, which of course, if you know uh, the underlying outcome distributions is an easy target because you then simply always assign uh, the best treatment. So if you somehow knew the causal effect, that would be good. But uh, the goal in itself is not to find causal effects here. The goal is to assign as many individuals as possible to uh, the best treatment. And that is what we write here in uh, italics here. So we want to minimize uh, the worst case regret by treating as many individuals as possible, as well as possible. Okay, now talk will get slightly more technical, but hopefully not too bad. Good, we need one assumption here, namely what we call here restricted Lipschitz continuity of the functional. So take some uh, CDF F uh, belonging to the set of CDFs calligraphic D that we want to find the worst case performance over and compare it to the value of the functional at some g, which is just simply some general CDF, typically that general d, uh, that general g will be the empirical CDF. Then we require the following inequality to be valid here, namely that if f and g are close to each other, so if two outcome distributions are close to each other, then also the value of the functionals that we target are close to each other. So in other words, if g is the empirical CDF, we require that if the empirical CDF is close to the population CDF f, i.e if I can estimate the population CDF, well, then I can also uh, estimate the value of the functional well, okay? So uh, this is the crucial assumption here in the paper. And of course, it's clear that there's a trade-off between the size of the class D that I can allow for, because this inequality has to hold for all F in calligraphic D here. So if I choose calligraphic D to be very large, it may be harder for this inequality to be satisfied, or I may need to choose this Lipschitz constant C larger um, than if I restrict the class at D severely. So ideally, I would like not to restrict D at all. I simply want to be agnostic about uh, the potential underlying potential outcome distribution. But that could have a price in the sense that C here must be larger, uh, because C will enter our upper bounds and maximum expected regret later. Okay. So that is the assumption that we need. Now, this assumption can be verified. Ah, this assumption here can be verified for a vast array of concrete functionals, and uh, we spent much time on this and the appendices of the paper. Here, it suffices to say that it's verified for all the inequality, welfare, and poverty measures that I've previously mentioned. So, for example, if you want to uh, focus on the Gini welfare measure, which I illustrate here at the bottom uh, of the page. Uh, and can be written, the Guinea welfare can be written the following way. So on the one hand, you have the mean pertaining to the potential outcome distribution F, but also you don't want too much dispersion as you measure, measure through this double integral here, which is also known as uh, the Guinea inequality measure. Well, if T is this Guinea welfare measure, then it turns out you can actually choose calligraphic D to be the full set of the CDF supported on the closed interval from A to B and this Lipschitz constant will be two times length of the interval. So in other words, uh, going one slide back, if T is the Gini welfare measure, then you, have to, you don't have to put any restrictions at all on the set of potential outcome distributions and we will still be able to prove upper bounds and the worst case performance of the algorithms that we're going to study. And we have an explicit expression for this Lipschitz constant here, um, which will enter the upper bounds. And similar results are given in the paper for other functionals of interest. Good. Now, a little bit of notations before we get uh, to the actual bounds. So denote by SI and T the number of times that treatment I has been assigned in the course of the first T assignments. Okay. And by F hat ITN, we denote uh, the empirical CDF uh, based on individuals assigned to treatment I. So hence the subscript I here, and it's individuals assigned to treatment I in, course of the in the course of the first T assignments here. Good. Now, how may one go about developing policies which have a good uh, worst case performance? Well, a natural idea is the following, since much attention has been devoted to randomized controlled trials. So point one, carry out an RCT in order to infer which treatment is actually best. So you set aside a certain number of observations, you carry out an RCT. 
then you either conduct a hypothesis test or you simply look at the treatment that uh, performs best empirically and then you choose to assign that to the remaining to the remaining subjects to be treated it turns out however that one can do better than that but let me first illustrate how well or how bad one can potentially do using such a two-step procedure here okay in particular this two-step procedure of first conducting an rct and then committing uh, to uh, the treatment that one infers to be best is a special case of a class of policies that we call explore and commit policies. So we call a policy pi and explore then commit policy if it satisfies the following two conditions. So first of all, it sets aside n1 observations to explore which treatment is best. And what do I mean by exploring? Well, it means that for each of the available treatments j, it assigns an expectation, uh, the treatment proportionally to the length of the exploration period. So uh, there exists some ADA, such as the number of times I expect to assign every treatment grows at least proportionately with N1. So this is of course satisfied if you conduct an RCT. So say there are K available treatments and you assign each treatment uh, with equal probability one over K. And uh, then for example, if I say N1 is equal to 100, and there are k, k equal to 10 treatments. Uh, each treatment is assigned in every round with a probability of 10%. So an expectation is assigned 10 times, 4.1 times. So uh, equal to 10 times. So I can choose eta equal to 0.1 in that case where there are k available treatments and I conduct an RCT. So the first condition is a rather innocuous one. It simply requires that in the course of the exploration phase, I actually explore. And Requirement two is that after the exploration phase, every treatment is assigned to the same treatment. So I commit to a treatment. Say the treatment that um, uh, had the highest mean, if I'm interested in the mean, okay? Good. So this is what we understand by explore and commit policies. And they have as a special case, these two-step policies based on first committing an RCT and then committing uh, to a treatment based on any possible uh, commitment rule. Okay, well, now to the first theoretical result. We first want to show that there are some fundamental limitations to using such uh, two, two phase strategies, namely first exploring and then committing. Fundamental limitations in the sense that their worst case performance is very bad, almost as bad as can be under a very mild assumption, namely this so-called non-triviality assumption. So consider the case where there are only k equal two available treatments and there exist two distributions f and g such that the treatment is not, uh, the, the function is not constant. So at least the function takes two different values. Well, we call this a non-triviality assumption because if the functional took the same value of all distributions, it didn't matter what you assign because no matter what you assign, it's the best one because everything is the best. So this is really a very innocuous assumption. So what can we show under this innocuous assumption? We start by considering policies that do not know in advance the total number of treatments that have to be made. So consider the case where N1, that is the length of the, treat, length of the exploration period, cannot depend on the total number of treatments for whatever reason. So it could either be that you don't know how many treatments uh, you have to make in total, or it could be that you ignore it. Uh, but N1 cannot depend on it. Well, what can one then show? One can show that for any explore then commit policy, so for any two-phase policy, the worst case performance, so take a supremum here over all potential outcome distributions, grows linearly in the total number of assignments. So this is as bad as it can be. Well, why is this as bad as it can be? Consider the following situation. Imagine I assign the worst treatment to every individual. That means to each of the n individuals, I incur a certain loss. How many assignments do I make in total? n. So I get n times this loss. So regret can never grow faster than linearly in n. And now we indeed show that for these two phase policies, the worst case regret actually increased linearly in n. So you cannot do worse than this. And what's the intuition behind this? Because it, the strategy somehow sounds sensible. Well, what is going on is the following. If you don't know in advance the total number of treatments that you're going to make, you simply have to choose some exploration period, say 100 or 1000. 
But no matter how long you choose the expiration period, it's still some fixed number. So vicious nature can always choose two potential outcome distributions that are very close to each other, such that you will make mistakes when you have to commit. That means sometimes when you commit, you commit to the wrong treatment. And recall, the commitment requirement is that you keep assigning the same, uh, the same treatment indefinitely after the expiration phase. So whenever you commit to the wrong treatment, you keep assigning the wrong treatment forever. And hence you get this linear regret. Okay, so this is, was for the case where one did not know in advance the total number of treatments to be made. It turns out you can do a little bit better if you actually know already that you have to make 1,000 treatments in total, you have to make 10,000 treatments in total. What can you do then? Well, you can adapt the length of the expiration period to the total number of assignments that you're going to make. So if you know you have to make only very few assignments in total, that is n is small, then you can choose n1, the length of the expiration period small, and vice versa. If you know you're going to make 1 million assignments in total, then you can choose n1, the length of the expiration period, to be much larger. So here it turns out to be the case when n is known, that the worst case performance of any explore and commit, that is any two-phase uh, policy, now only increases at a sub-polynomial rate. So it's no longer linear and n, rather the worst case performance increases at a rate that uh, has a power of only n to the power 2 over 3 in n. So this is better than before. At least it's, it's now better than, you know, the linear regret that even the worst of all policies um, uh, can guarantee. So the final question I want to ask and answer in the context of these two-phase explore and commit policies is, is this lower bound here sharp? That is, do there exist two-phase uh, policies which actually attain this rate of uh, n to the power 2 over 3? And we can answer this question in the affirmative. A very simple and logical policy does indeed attain this rate. So consider the following policy. You said n1, the length of the expiration period, proportional to um, n to the power 2 over 3. So um, you let the length of the expiration period increase with, uh, with n, but not linearly in n. So as a fraction of the total number of assignments, the length of the expiration phase grows uh, slower than n. And then you conduct an RCT based on n1 observations. That is, uh, the policy assigns uh, to these first n1 individuals uh, simply treatments uniformly on i. So gt is a random variable that is distributed uniformly on the set of potential uh, treatments. Okay, Then in phase two, you assign forever to all remaining individuals the treatment that maximizes t valued at the empirical CDF based on the experiment that you conducted. And the properties of this two-phase policy are as follows. Well, it turns out that the worst case performance over this non-parametric class D here increases now at rate n to the power 2 over 3 in uh, the total number of assignments that, can, that are made. And we know this is as good as, good as you can do within this class of two-phase policies because we've just shown on this slide here, I just went back two slides, that no two-phase policy can do better than the rate n to the power 2 over 3. Okay, very good. Now, this was two-phase policies. This is a natural start to take. However, one may wonder whether one can do better. And indeed, one can do better by not restricting oneself to uh, um, dividing the policy into two phases. Rather than only exploring in the beginning and then committing to one treatment, it turns out that one can do better if... Uh, one keeps exploring indefinitely, but uh, less and less frequently. But you should always check that you're on the right path. So where these two-phase policies could go wrong is if you commit to the wrong treatment. Because if, once you commit to the wrong treatment, you stop exploring. Rather, one should once in a while check whether one is on the right path. So that is what the policies that we're going to look at next do. They keep exploring indefinitely, but uh, less and less frequently because you still want to assign often uh, 
the best treatment. But once in a while, you check whether you're on the right path. Okay. Now, through these uh, fully sequential policies. So we next investigate what can be gained by departing from the class of explore then uh, commit policies. In particular, we study a policy which does not separate the exploration and the exploitation phase into uh, two phases. So the first policy that we're going to look at is inspired by a classic problem, by a classic uh, algorithm for bandits uh, when targeting the mean, namely the so-called UCB policy. It's this UCB stands for upper confidence bound policy. And uh, the underlying logic is uh, optimism in the, face, in the face of uncertainty. So imagine uh, that T is the mean. In this case, T evaluated at, at F hat would simply be the sample average. And this extra term here, the C times the square root thing could be seen as, uh, as the upper limit of a confidence interval. So imagine you want to construct a confidence interval for mu, uh, the population mean. Well, you would take the sample mean in, ca in case t is the mean functional and then add something extra uh, where typically you divide by square root of number of observations that have been assigned to that treatment. Recall that si is the number of assignments that I've made uh, to treatment i. This looks a little bit like the upper limit of a confident, confidence interval. So what the policy is doing is the following. In the first k rounds, it assigns each treatment once. So individual one is assigned to treatment one, individual two to treatment two, and so on, until the first k treatments have been assigned. Thereafter, we get to this uh, on, um, optimism in the face of uncertainty principle. Because thereafter, you assign a treatment if A, T evaluated at the empirical CDF, is high, so the treatment looks promising, or B, the treatment has not been well explored in the sense that SI is small. So notice what's going on here. F hat here, as you assign I more and more often, hopefully approximates the true CDF better and better. And we of course want to assign the treatment uh, I, which maximizes T here. So gradually we know more and more about um, um, uh, which of the treatment is best. So we want to focus more and more energy in sampling from the treatment that empirically performs best. That is, it uh, materializes itself through the fact that this term here that I'm circling now tends to zero because I, as, as I assign treatment I more and more often, as I tends to infinity. In particular, we make sure that as I grows faster to infinity than this log T term here. So this term here goes to zero, which means gradually I put more and more emphasis on simply assigning the treatment that looks promising in practice. While in the beginning, uh, this term here, the second term could still be rather large, meaning I do exploration. But I never stop exploring entirely. Because what would happen if I stopped exploring entirely? Well, then as I would be bounded, it's fixed. That means the denominator here is some fixed number, while log t, while sorry, log t here would tend to infinity, meaning that this second term would totally dominate this sum here. Uh, and as the second term tends to infinity, I would eventually try that ith arm again for which si was bounded. So that means si uh, cannot be bounded. Every treatment is uh, explored in depth infinitely often, but uh, at less and less frequency. Okay. Good. How does this policy perform now? Um, well, oh, let me just make two remarks. Uh, first of all, we know that this policy does not rely on external randomization. So we don't see any GT entering here. Also, and this is very crucial, is that the policy does not have to know in advance the total number of treatments that have to be made. Recall that uh, the explore and commit policy here, for which we could prove sublinear worst case performance, had to know the horizon since n1 had to depend on n. Now this policy here, the FUCB, the functional UCB policy, does not have to know n. Yet we shall see shortly that it can uh, attain good regret bounds nevertheless. Okay, well, next to the bounds. What can we show? We can show that the worst case performance of this FUCB policy uh, 
has a regret that increases only a little bit faster than the square root of n. There's this actual log term here underneath the square root, but more or less square root of n, uh, worst case performance. And crucially, this shows that the worst case performance of this FUCB policy is better um, even than the lower bound that any two-phase policy uh, must obey. So let me go back just to remind you that even if I know n, so now I'm back at the slide for uh, two-phase policies, even if I knew the total number of assignments that I have to make, there exists no policy which has a regret that uh, uh, accumulates slower than n to the power two over three. Now we know that the upper bound for the FUCB policy only increases uh, at rate square root of n. So we can drive a wedge between uh, the lower bound for uh, any two-phase policy and the upper bound for the FUCB policy. So whenever possible, uh, one should not use uh, these two-phase policies if the objective is to minimize expected uh, worst case performance here. Okay, now one may of course ask, well, that's fine and good. We can do better than two-phase policies, but is this optimal? Well, that is what uh, I will talk about next, namely optimality uh, over the class of all policies. So next, um, we should prove an upper bound, a lower bound on the maximum expected regret that any policy, not necessarily a two-phase policy, but any policy uh, must incur. So any policy must have a worst case performance that increases at least at rate square root of n here. So we see that the FUCB policy, let me go one slide back, is almost optimal in the sense that if I could remove this logarithmic term here, then it would be optimal. Um, so this raises the question now, of course, do there exist policies which are exactly minimax optimal, um, i.e. for which we can remove this logarithmic term here. So in jargon, one would say that the FUCB policy is near minimax optimal because it's minimax optimal up to a logarithmic factor. Um, but can we remove this logarithmic factor? Question mark. And that is... Um, the last theoretical result I will torture you with before I go on to a, a couple of simulations and an application. Okay, it turns out again that we can answer the question in the affirmative. Um, namely, uh, can the rate square root n be attained in the lower bound of maximum expected regret? Yes, it can by the so called functional anytime must policy. Mm. Now, this policy works as follows. And um, it assigns in rounds one up to K every treatment once. So that is exactly as for the FUCB policy, no difference. But thereafter it begins to differ. It still has this term here, T evaluated at the empirical CDF, but then the extra term is different. It explores uh, less than um, the FUCB policy. So let me remind you by looking at the bottom of the screen, the FUCB policy looks like this when I'm circling here. So it also has this T evaluated uh, the empirical CDF, but then the expiration term is generally larger. For example, here there's a log T, while up here it's only log T, but divided by the number of times I've assigned treatment I. So imagine I've assigned treatment I, uh, that is SI being equal to um, K divided by T minus one. So if, if I've assigned treatment i proportionately uh, to, to the number of assignments made so far. Well, then this logarithmic term here will be zero. And I, in fact, assign exactly the treatment that uh, maximizes the function and variable as an empirical CDF. So long story short, the farmer's policy is slightly more aggressive than the FUCB policy. And this turns out to be crucial uh, for uh, the minimax regret. Well, crucial in the sense of it being able to remove a logarithmic term. So we may say this is more for aficionados of uh, minimax optimality, uh, but it also performs better in practice as we shall see uh, shortly. Okay, so the farmer's policy, I shall not state this theorem formally here, is exactly a minimax rate optimum. That is the maximum expected regret over D 
the non-parametric class of uh, potential outcome distributions that we consider increases at rate square root of n, and we know no policy can exist that does then that does better than this. Let me also stress that this policy here uh, that we uh, provide works even better than uh, the available policies for the case of t being the mean only. Um, um, so, which is also uh, quite interesting. So, in summary, the farm mass policy here is often superior in practice, and it is hence our recommended policy. Now, let me illustrate what I mean by it being superior in practice by A, providing some simulation evidence, and B, providing uh, some evidence based on a real data set, after which I shall leave the floor for some questions. Okay, so consider the case where there are k equal to two treatments and we're going to make n equal to 100,000 treatments in total. However, the policies do not incorporate n. That is, they do not know how many assignments are going to be made in total. Okay, so the policies cannot use this n. And uh, we consider the FUCB policy and the farmers policy along with two explore and commit policies. And the two explore and commit policies, the TC policies, and um, they assign treatments cyclically in the course of the expiration period. That is, if they assign treatment one, treatment two, treatment one, treatment two, treatment one, treatment two. That is what I mean by cyclically. However, they differ in the choice of commitment rules. We consider what we call ETCT, explore and commit policies, the T standing for test. So these are uh, explore and commit policies where you perform a power calculation. So that is too often done in practice that you choose the length of the exploration pace in order to ensure that uh, a test that you want to base your commitment decision on has at least power, say 0.9, against an economically relevant uh, alternative that you want to be able to detect. So we make a power calculation and decide based on that power calculation what N1, the length of the exploration period, should be. Secondly, we consider um, explore and commit empirical success policies. So these are policies where you don't choose a test to uh, decide which uh, treatment to assign after the expiration period, but you simply assign the treatment that performed best in practice. So if you're interested in the mean, you assign the treatment with the highest sample mean after the expiration phase. If you're interested in the Gini welfare, you simply assign um, the treatment that had the highest Gini welfare when evaluated at the empirical CDF after the expiration phase. Okay, so these are the policies that we're going to consider, and we're going to consider Gini welfare. Uh, and we're going to consider the worst case performance over a large class of distributions. So in the plot that I'm showing you here, there are six lines. The two black lines are the worst ones. We see here the regret accumulated in the course of 100,000 observations. So each time I make a wrong assignment, I incur a little bit of regret, right? Because I compare myself to what had I, what could I have done, what could I have done had I known the best treatment I assigned that one. So the two black policies are bad. Let me get those out of the picture right away. The two black ones here are the explore and commit policies that use a test-based commitment rule. They're terrible. They incur very high regret, both of them. Um, so we compare two different tests here. That's why there are two of them. Basically, these two tests are based on um, two different power requirements. Uh, so in one of them, I think, require maybe 0.9 power against an alternative for the other one, 0.95. But forget about those two because they're bad. Then we have the, one, the policies, the red and, the, and uh, the green one, where you use an empirical success-based commitment rules. Rule. They're better. They're down here, the red and the green one. However, they're still beaten by the blue line, the FUCB policy, and the farmers policy, which is our favorite policy. What this graph here somehow hides is that even the farmers policy is three times better than the UCB policy. So at the end of the sample, at the, so when 100,000 assignments have been made, the regret incurred by the FUCB policy, I think, is around 500, while for the farmers policy, it's uh, 400, no, sorry, 160, so more than a factor three. So, in some senses, yellow line is three times 
lower than the blue line, but it's simply hidden by the fact that the two black lines distort uh, the axis here. So in terms of worst case performance, there's no doubt that our current recommendation is uh, the farmer's uh, policy. Let's then go to some real data sets, uh, finally. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned these points here already. Yeah, that farmers is best, then FUCB, then ETCES, and then ETC test based. Good. Let me spend the last two, three minutes on a small application. So we consider a cognitive abilities program. So that is a program where IQ tests were performed on elderly individuals. One group of individuals, those in the treatment group, participated in an online training program targeting various cognitive capacities. And then there was a so-called active control group, active in the sense that they were asked to solve crossword puzzles. Um, and then one looks in the end, okay, was the treatment effective or not? Now we take a sequential view on uh, this problem here and want to assign as many individuals as possible to uh, the best treatment. So there's of course this trade-off between gradually learning whether the treatment is best or whether these active control uh, assignments, crossword puzzles are best. So this is a case where K is equal to two. And let me just mention that uh, uh, the outcome variable is a neuropsychological performance measure. This is just jargon for IQ type measure. The following plot here contains now the point-wise expect regret uh, for Gini welfare measure. Why the point-wise? Well, this is because this is just for one specific experiment conducted in this paper. So one specific data set. While theory and simulations have been for worst case performances. So we've taken the supremum, i.e. maximum over many distributions. But here we consider particular outcome distributions as that is point-wise regret. Well, what do we get? We again get that uh, the black lines here are terrible, so forget about those. Now, FUCB, sorry, the farmer's policy, the yellow one still performs quite well, but the green one, the explore and commit policy, uh, based on an empirical success rule, performs quite well as well. And also the FUCB policy performs uh, uh, decently, but it's no longer the second best when it's beaten by one of uh, the explore and uh, commit policies. Okay, I think that is what I wanted to say. I think I basically took more time than one than was allotted to me because I used some of Michel's time. He was kind enough to give it to me. So uh, maybe there are some questions. If they're easy, I'll try to answer them. Uh, may I ask a question? And there's maybe but, just... okay. I mean, can you apply this COVID nineteen? Well, of course, the easy answer is you can always apply it. The difficult question is, is it useful for COVID-19? Um, and indeed, these sequential policies have been used actually in the context of uh, COVID-19. So there's a recent working paper by a colleague of mine, Maximilian Kasi, um, who look at um, different ways of assigning. Um, so diff what do they do? Let me just think what exactly the treatment there is. Uh, Oh yeah, they look at um, vaccines actually, whom to assign vaccines to. So say vaccines yeah, exactly. are yes. a scarce resource. Yes. So um, you may, um, uh, no, sorry, this, it's not vaccines, it's a test. In the beginning of the COVID-19, there was a lack of tests. Maybe in some countries, there's still a lack of tests. So you may assign the test to those people, which for sure seem to feel very bad, but that could also be a waste of tests because you already know they feel quite bad. Or you could assign them to those who are connected to many other people. Uh, so basically the short answer is they think, yes, it can be used. You should can sequentially learn which people, if the testing capacity is limited, um, would uh, it be most useful to assign the test to. But they focus so like, on, the, on the mean only and policy so like, the mean. So like in, in a real example, what does your... Um policy do like in this um, example that you gave. Mm -hmm. So what is what is the specific policy? So like there's a cognitive test. So people give like puzzles to the elderly people to see. Yeah, yeah exactly. And what, what well, is your what, difference? So like what is what, what does is the following. So you know, um, it's sequential. So person one arrives, okay, you may put this person to the actual treatment. Okay. You see how well did this person do? Then person two arrives, you may put it to the control. 
mm -hmm. uh, and you see how well the person then does. Now you have two pieces of information. Um, uh, and then the third person arrives. And then you assign to either the control or, or uh, the treatment. And your goal is to maximize um, uh, the sum of improvements in, uh, in IQ. So uh, say, actually, um, the, the treatment actually improves IQ by, by five points. So but why, why is sequential is better? Because you get like you, you learn your uh, objects better? Yeah. Exactly, you want to make use. So uh, that's basically what the theory showed also that you shouldn't divide in two phases. Uh, two phase policies are not good because if you do a two phase policy, you stop exploring at some point. Say you say assi assign 100 elderly people uh, to an exploration phase. In the exploration phase, 50 to control and 50 to treatment. Okay, and then you do a hypothesis test, but there's some probability that you don't get the right outcome of that hypothesis test. Uh, that means on that event, you will always assign the worst possible treatment uh, of those two treatments to all remaining individuals. And you want to avoid this. So one of the messages... Oh, yeah, I mean, like randomly assigning is not a good idea. You have to be careful in assigning to groups, to people, treatment. And then the sequential gives you, buys you that. Yeah, exactly. And so it's the minimized message... optimal and others are not. Correct. The message is... I mean, if you're interested in these regret measures, then these two-phase policies are suboptimal. You should use fully sequential policies that uh, keep exploring. But of course, you know, if you, this is not discrediting what people do if they want to find causal effects. That's a different objective, simply. Sure, um, sure, yeah. But you yours know, design, yeah, yours is design of the data, design of the project, rather than. Exactly. Yeah. But we somehow try to take serious what is useful for a policymaker, because mm -hmm. just to be uh, a little bit provocative to be the devil's advocate. Um, this is not necessarily my opinion. But you, you, you see many papers that do yeah. an experiment, they say, oh, we find a causal effect. But how do I use this as a policymaker? Uh, is the recommendation I should assign all individuals to the treatment with that effect? Or what is the policy recommendation based on, on those papers? So we try to take serious that the experiment should uh, incorporate also what you want to use the outcome of the experiment to. It shouldn't just be a paper for the archive. <laughs> but like in, in your case, the one difference is like, it will take more time to finish the study. No, yes, yeah, that could be a case that, uh, because you could of course call in everyone yeah. uh, if you want to do an RCT and do it simultaneously. This is yeah. actually correct, yeah. yeah. It could take longer. So that is, that is indeed uh, a drawback. Uh, but sometimes it's not too bad because people do arrive sequentially in unemployment yeah, programs. Exactly. So you could do it every month. You do it in batches then. You know, every month you start a new round. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and there are lots of studies like that, I think. Yeah, yeah. So Anders, in question section, we have a question. In practice, there is, a, is there a time in which you stop to explore? Um, that, of course, I mean, it depends on the policy you're using. For these explore and commit policies, let me just... Go back. The explore and commit policies. They explore for n one periods, say one hundred. After which you have to make a decision, say based on hypothesis test. And after that, you don't explore. Well, you still observe outcomes of treatments, but only of the treatment that you committed to. So, for explore and commit policies, the answer is yes. There is a time in which you stop exploring, and that is exactly why they have a bad worst case performance. While the fully sequential policies, let me go a few slides ahead to give an example here, the UCB policy, it never stops exploring. Um, I tried to give some intuition for it, um, but let me just do it again. So imagine you stop exploring SI, the number of times I assign treatment I, imagine it's some bounded number. Then you have this log T as more and more individuals arrive, T tends to infinity, okay? But you, this policy at science, the treatment that maximizes this sum here. But now the second term tends to infinity if you start exploring, okay? That means, of course, uh, you would not stop exploring because at some point, uh, treatment I would have the maximal sum here since this term here tends to infinity. So uh, that is sort of the whole point of these sequential, fully sequential policies that do not stop exploring. And that is what allows us to get a better worst case performance than for the two-phase policies.
and we receive an email and they are asking as some RCTs, even the, at the designing stage, everything is important. So any RCT requires anything specific to implement this method or you decide to implement this method after having some data from an RCT after it is implemented. Okay, so if you want to do, so it could be, for example, due to some resource constraints that you're forced to do a two-phase policy that, you know, you've been allotted some money to conduct an experiment and after that you must commit. So let's assume basically that you, it's been ruled out that you can do the fully sequential policy. So you're in the framework of uh, two-phase policies. And then the question is, is there anything uh, particular uh, you should be aware of? Not really. It suffices that it's a genuine RCT that you simply assign the treatment in the course of the expiration phase randomly as that is independently of potential uh, treatment outcomes. That, that, so nothing particular here. Notice also, just to make a little bit of self-promotion, what I presented today is there are no covariates. Of course, the potential treatment outcomes could be different for different individuals. And if you're still interested in this after the talk, there's a paper on archive where you can find it on my website also, where you consider the case where um, um, there are covariates as well. So that is, one is interested in targeting the treatment for an individual with covariates X, which has the highest uh, functional when you evaluate the conditional outcome distributions. But just quickly to answer the question again, no, nothing particular to be aware of for the RCT. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I think there is no other question. So thanks okay. for your very good talk. Thank you for having me. Um, yep. UK, we are moving to Italy. Stop, Thank you very much, Andres. Thank you. Thank you.